Welcome this morning, those who are watching and those watching online as well, those in the fellowship hall. This is the end of the church season. It's called Christ the King Sunday. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. And let us bow before him, yielding our desires and devotion to him alone. So I invite you to rise in body or spirit. And as a sign of obedience and praise to God, if you would bow your head and open your palms out in a posture of receiving and yielding. Our Lord and our King, help us as we worship to discover anew our place and service in the kingdom of God. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, may you ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown. Uh, we feel more than ever the desire to belong and to be together and to be in communion with God. So next Sunday we hope in the Lord to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And because that is a holy celebration, uh, something we look forward to, we, we prepare for it. So prepare your hearts and minds and souls to celebrate our communion with the Lord. The Lord's Supper proclaims that God has come to us. Jesus is God with us 
and God one of us. He not only shares our life, he gives his life for the sin of the world in order to justify our lives and redeem those who trust in his grace alone. With the bread and the cup, we remember that we know God and are known by God because the Father gave the Son, and the Son gave his life, and the Spirit gives us faith to believe. We receive this bread and cup with both sadness and joy. We lament that our fellowship has been strained by isolation and distancing. We miss the physical contact from being together as the family of God. But Jesus is our joy, who keeps us united in his body through virtual worship, shared prayers and care that no physical distancing can prevent. The Lord's Supper is our thanksgiving. When Jesus took the bread and broke it, he gave thanks. And now as we prepare to take the bread and cup, we give thanks, pledging that in the breaking and giving of what matters most to us, this is an offering in his name, and God is glorified. And so the Lord's Supper blesses us with hope. Our hope for a new creation is not tied to what we human beings can do. For we believe that one day every challenge to God's rule will be crushed. His kingdom will fully come and the Lord will rule. We long for that day when our bodies are raised, the Lord wipes away our tears, and we are seated at the wedding supper of the Lamb. The Father will proclaim the words that we are all created and redeemed to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. In the joy of the Lord, come and enter my rest. And so we take the Lord's Supper finally to say, Lord Jesus, come. Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. We're going to do a kid's song together now. We've been talking about justice for a couple weeks. We've said we're not only in a pandemic season, um, this pandemic has also revealed um, the cries for justice in our land. And those cries are no less complicated than dealing with COVID-19. So we've been talking about how we are supposed to respond. And in all the complication, we can remember simply that each person is made in the image of God and so as a vulnerable person is valuable. And this simple children's song reminds us of that. Jesus loves the little children all, the children of the world. So we're going to sing it through twice. And let's join in. Let's join in prayer. 
Holy Spirit, you have gathered us. And all through the ages, you have preserved the word of God. So now as we open that text, may we open it anew. And may that fresh word that brings life get into our minds and our hearts and our souls. That we may live for the glory of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of the Lord. I thought I knew what it meant to be a Christian. You acknowledge Jesus as your Savior by confessing you are a sinner. You receive God's grace, forgiveness from our sins. You worship, you pray, you give and serve. You take to heart the Ten Commandments and practice obedience, confession, and forgiveness, and thanksgiving. You develop a habit of devotions where you take to heart the Bible and take God at his word, living by faith, hope, and love. You promise and commit to participating in a church community, serving with your gifts. Actions and attitudes like that make for a person who lives the Christian life. Am I missing anything? What I've learned is that I am missing what flows from the very character of God. Justice. Without thinking about it, we can live as if righteousness is personal and faithfulness is private. But loving God and loving our neighbor cannot be separated. John Calvin believed that we must act justly in order to live piously. He says, the observance of justice and equity towards men is the means which we are to employ in testifying a pious fear of God if we truly possess it. In this season, where injustice is getting as close to us as the pandemic, and we're all as much at a loss of what to do about it, Jesus is the standard and measure of justice. We learned that last week. And justice begins with loving our neighbor, because each person is made in the image of God. We learned that the week before. Can you agree with me that this season is not just about being careful? It is also about learning to be just, to do justice. So we take notice when Jesus tells a parable about justice. This is how I want you to be my disciples, he teaches. What's he telling us about the God of justice? So Luke 18 talks about justice, but first it ties it to faithful, prayerful endurance. 
Verse 1 states, Jesus told this parable to show the disciples and us that we should always pray and not give up. Our faith relationship with God the Father through Jesus and by the Spirit is personal, but it is not private. It is lived out in community, Christ church, but that's not a closed circle. We pray together, but we also seek to love our neighbor together, to show hospitality to the stranger, and even to love our enemy. Our prayers confess that justice is always an act of hope, tied not to what we can accomplish, but what God has promised. And our prayers confess that since justice matters to God, it should matter to us. Jesus tells the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. There's a bad judge to whom a widow comes who has been treated unjustly. The judge refuses her for some time, says Jesus, but she keeps petitioning him. Finally, the judge gives in and vindicates her because she keeps bothering him, he says. Before rushing to our questions, what what does this mean or what are we supposed to do with this? Jesus tells us the story to get us to see. See the woman living in in injustice. See that she is vulnerable. See that she has been wronged. Hear her cry out with no one else listening. See the injustice. Envision the corrupt official. Feel the helplessness and the despair that she carries. And see that Jesus loves this woman. See her. Don't lose sight of her as a person whom the Creator gave life. The God of justice sees and hears this one who is vulnerable and yet valued. And understand that disciples of Jesus are saved and gifted to bring the good news of Jesus into injustice like this. Abraham Kuyper said, what we are to do as a church together is make disciples rather than change society, but we are to form disciples in the image of Christ who go out into God's creation to do justice. And in such service, society is changed. Here are just a few of the many Bible verses revealing the character of the one just God. Listen, take them to heart. Have we ignored verses like these? Psalm 9 verse 8, He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. Psalm 68 verse 5, A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Luke 11 verse 42, Woe to you Pharisees because you give give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. In James 1, verse 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Justice comes out of the very heart of God. and This is what justice should look like. Yes, there are things that God hates, that God stands against because of his great love for the poor, the weak, the last, little, and lost. Our repentance means loving the things God loves. 
acting to restore what's broken and hating the things God hates, standing against injustice. So let's look a little more closely. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. So right away we understand that there is injustice in the world, and that offends God, and we should care about that. Jesus is using an example from everyday life to describe the suffering in our world caused by sin. Jesus is stating again why he came and reminding his disciples that he is on the way to Jerusalem for a reason, to bring mercy and justice by his suffering injustice in order to defeat it. He uses the example of a widow because his followers would have remembered a story like that that they learned when they were in synagogue school as kids. They learned a story from the apocryphal book of Sirach that told of a widow who poured out her trouble and cries to be done right by. And the disciples would hear Jesus now and say, hey, we know that story. We were taught that story, Jesus. We know about this. But Jesus adds something new to the story. Jesus adds, in the kingdom of God, justice matters. And his disciples are committed to prayerfully seeking justice for those who are vulnerable and oppressed. Jesus goes on with the parable. The widow has approached the judge over and over to no avail. But then, the surprise, relief. There is justice. Verses 4 and 5. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. And here Jesus changes the story from the one the disciples would remember learning as kids. In that story, after the widow's sorrow is mentioned, the passage goes on to teach what a righteous man in God's sight will do. And it says there, he whose service is pleasing to the Lord will be accepted. The message the disciples learned as boys was that injustice is to be endured. It's a test. And you truly belong to the Lord if you keep serving God despite the obstacles. But Jesus changes the story. Jesus is saying something different. Jesus instead keeps the widow's cause in front of us. And that cause at first seems hopeless. Because judges, the judge doesn't care at all about what's right or what's due. So what can the widow do? She's a woman in a man's world, a widow without money or powerful friends. The judge cannot be appealed to out of duty to God. And no human being can make him ashamed of any blind eye, he turns to injustice. Yet, this woman not only gets a hearing, she gets justice. The case is settled in her favor. She doesn't make the difference. Her cause doesn't make the difference. The judge doesn't make the difference. God does. In changing the story, Jesus is changing the story of our lives. Without the God of justice, life won't change. Jesus' point is, since this hopeless woman found deliverance, how much more should God's people confidently give themselves to the causes of God? For the Heavenly Father is just and does care and responds out of his love and mercy. Jesus highlights this grace in verses 7 and 8. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Jesus is not really asking whether God the Father will do at least what the unjust judge does. He's saying there's a common grace behind even crooked leaders 
sometimes doing what's right. It's popular today to justify one's cause saying, I'm on the right side of history. But Jesus measures justice truly and says we should yearn to be on the right side of God. You can trust your Heavenly Father when you give yourselves to the cause of the widow and the poor. And that's behind Jesus' last question at the end of verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? See? He says, what I mean by faith isn't merely a private prayer and worship. I mean seeing the widow, seeing the injustice, and by faith doing something about it. So how can we respond? Can we include the cause of justice in our discipleship and faith? I know the issues are complicated and they are divisive. What to do about poverty? How to confess both personal and systemic racism? What to do about beginning and end of life issues? How to be stewards of creation and the environment. How to show hospitality to the foreigner and the refugee. And also the personal struggles of the LGBTQ person. Yet resisting the political coercion that comes from those quarters, which is ungodly. Remember to start where we started. Each person is made in the image of God, and we are to love our neighbor. John Calvin said, to do justice is to cultivate good faith and equity with our neighbors, then to defend all good causes, and to take the innocent under our patronage when we see them unjustly injured. Jesus gathered his church to do this. The church is tasked with serving the world and not merely surviving in it. And I think we have been trained and equipped and blessed with the resources to add the measure of Christ into the cry for justice today. And this way comes to mind. See how you connect with this. By our commitment to and participation in those institutions that have arisen out of the church in response to the needs around us. Everything from local institutions like Elam Christian Society and World Relief and Love Incorporated and Providence Life Services to denominational institutions like World Renew and Safe Church and Disability Concerns. All these institutions grew and thrived in our grandparents' and parents' days. We could easily forget about them because they're not ours, so to speak. They're grandpa's thing or their mom's thing. And support for these institutions has dropped especially among our younger generations. But these institutions give us a social standing to address in a Christ-like way just responses to social needs. Our involvement and participation will help form the heart of God within us so that we learn to see injustice for what it really is and respond confidently because Jesus reigns as king. And then we can rise above all the ways that we are pressured by political groups or cultural conformities and bless with the presence of Jesus who sees the one in distress. 
I was thinking about this when I read about David Brooks, who just received the Kuiper Award. And he spoke about how fragmented and suspicious and angry we are at one another in our country. And how Christians are contributing to that anger and suspicion and fragmentation. Aren't followers of the Prince of Peace supposed to do something about that? And if we don't, who will? And he said, social trust is built within the nitty-gritty work of organizational life. Going to meetings, driving people places, planning events, sitting with the ailing, rejoicing with the joyous, showing up for the unfortunate. It is built through volunteering at polling places in schools and houses of worship and charities. So this requires building and maintaining Christian institutions of all kinds, but it also requires moving outside the walls of those institutions and engaging and challenging and even serving our neighbors, Christian or not. For human beings are both valuable and vulnerable. and We have an obligation toward one another that comes from Jesus who revealed the God of justice. Alistair McIntyre reminds us that human flourishing depends on a network of uncalculated giving and graceful receiving People who make your good their good without any hope for getting anything back in return. And you take care of yourself best when you carefully make the good of another person your own good. Loving our neighbor and even our enemy. This first posture of justice will honor the justice of God and help share our just responses to his glory. The calling of the Christian absolutely does not lie in the sphere of the church alone, said Abraham Kuyper. Christians also have a calling in the life of the world. And the question as to how this is possible, how it is conceivable that a child of God should still be involved with a sinful world has a brief, clear, and simple answer. We must, because God himself is still involved with that world. Amen. Let's pray. Sovereign King and Lord, enthroned in glory over all creation, you are a shepherd to the lost and the least. Teach us to sense your presence among the poor, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the cold, giving shelter to the refugee, and visiting those who are sick or in prison so that we may share in your eternal realm, prepared from the foundation of the world. All glory and honor to you. Reign with justice, compassion, and love. Deliver us, Father, from every evil, and grant to a divided world the peace of the kingdom of your Son. Keep us free from the sins for which in his love he died on the cross, Reassure us in the trials of life that those who serve him loyally will share in his joy at the coming in glory of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We open our hearts to you, praying for mercy as we remember Pat Serrano, Ginny Jupp, Lenore De Bruin, Rick Hopp, and Marty Hoekstra, who was hospitalized this week and looks like he will be on palliative care now. And also 
bring mercy to Jenny Post, who was diagnosed with COVID-19 this week. And we pray for all those with ongoing illness, conditions, and battling cancer. We pray for those looking for employment. We ask a blessing on the work of World Renew to address world hunger. We pray that the Spirit lead us to choose kindness, patience, and generosity in these uncertain and challenging days. May relief and medical aid get to those suffering after the hurricane in Nicaragua. Protect Christians in Nigeria and Mozambique facing heightened threats. And thank you that Dr. Davids is home now. Continue to strengthen her. And together we thank you for the birth of Leah Christine Munson and ask that you bless Emma and Andrew as we join with them in thanks for this precious gift of life. And now, Lord Jesus, hear the concerns of our own hearts. We give our worries and anxious thoughts to you. Restore our faith. Continue to shape us in the likeness of Christ so that in all our roles, relationships, and responsibilities, we live confident of your peace and purposes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. The deacons will say some words for us as we continue to respond in thanks to the Lord. Before Erica prays for today's offering, we just wanted to give you a heads up for our Thanksgiving offering, which is for Grace and Peace Church um, in Chicago. We're partnering with them again this year for their annual Christmas store event where low-income families can come to Grace and Peace Church. They can shop for Christmas gifts for their kids and we can give them a turkey dinner to take home with them. Um, this year, because of COVID, the event is gonna be all outdoors and contact free. So the families will drive up to the parking lot and the volunteers will put the Christmas gifts and the dinners in, their, in the trunk of their car. Um, if you're able to help out, we'd love a few volunteers to help with the morning shift and a few for the afternoon shift. It's going to be on Saturday, Saturday, Saturday December 12th. Um, you can talk to myself or Josh Meyer for more information on that. Um, secondly, we really would love your financial support. This year, the turkeys are more expensive because there's a shortage of the size that we need. So we're asking... Um, if everyone can please consider giving generously as you're able to. And there's two ways to give. Um, online through the Givelify app, you can donate and there's an option to select um, the offering cause. And then you can also mail a check to church. Just be sure to write in the memo line of the check um, that is for grace and peace. Thanks. Hi, I'm Grace. I didn't grow up Christian Reformed, but in the past few months, I've discovered so much about what it means to be a part of this church. God's providence and covenant promises actually cover every square inch of creation and every part of life. And in my new members class, I heard about ministry shares for the very first time. So maybe you wonder, what's the story with ministry shares? Is it some kind of tax? Is it used to pay salaries at church headquarters? It's so much more than that. Ministry shares pay for missionaries to spread the gospel in Nigeria and dozens of other countries. They support the development of Sunday school materials for our kids and help our churches prevent and respond to situations of abuse. They also help our denomination train new ministers and support deacons and elders. That's just for starters. The list of amazing things ministry shares support goes on and on and on. So now you may be thinking, okay, but my church is pretty small and we each only pay a few hundred dollars for ministry shares each year. How could one small church pay for so much ministry around the globe? It's not just you, and it's not just me, but it's more than a quarter million people across North America. We're all doing our small part to do ministry together, and the impact is enormous. 
Way back in 1862, Christian Reformed people made a covenant together to launch ministries that would help fulfill God's calling and build up God's kingdom. It was effective and efficient crowdfunding 150 years before anyone knew to call it that, and it's still going strong. When all of our ministry shares are pulled together, it creates a fund that makes it possible for a relatively small denomination to have a global reach and footprint. Think of the incredible impact of our mission agencies, our Christian university, and our denomination seminary. Ministry shares help our congregations to be innovative in worship and foster faith formation in people of all ages. They support us in our work for racial reconciliation and help deepen our understanding of social issues. They improve accessibility and inclusion for people of all abilities. They equip chaplains to do ministry in hospitals, workplaces, and military sites. Ministry shares are mighty and important as each one of us shares in the work of furthering God's kingdom. I'm excited to be a part of this covenant relationship and to see what God is doing around the world through ministry shares and our denomination's multifaceted outreach. Talk with a deacon, elder, or treasurer at your church today to discover how your congregation supports ministry shares as we live out our calling together. Hi, I'm Grace. I didn't grow Today's offering is for missions. Uh, will you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity we have to gather together as a church. Bless this offering and gift as that we receive to further your kingdom. Protect those that boldly go out into your world to preach the good news, particularly in areas where it has become dangerous. May this offering help spread your gospel and bring others to Christ. In your name we pray, amen. your eyes and body your spirit.
we go with God's blessing, follow along on the screen. And let's respond. As followers of Jesus Christ living in this world, which some seek to control, but which others view with despair, we declare with joy and trust our world belongs to God. From the beginning, through all the crises of our times, until his kingdom fully comes, God keeps covenant forever. Our world belongs to God. God is king. Let earth be glad. Christ is victor. His rule has begun. Hallelujah. The spirit is at work renewing the creation. Praise the Lord. seated for a moment and the ushers will uh, usher you out.